We are in the Gospel of Mark. We are continuing our studies in the sixth chapter. We're going to look at verses 30 through 44. And really, we, we pick up where the chapter left off in verse 13. At the beginning of Mark 6, Jesus goes to Nazareth. He ministers there. He's rejected there. Who is this? This is the carpenter, they said. Where did he get this authority? And they rejected him. Then he sent his disciples out on a preaching mission in, throughout Galilee to the villages there. And now they come back to report on what they had done. Now in between there is the story of Herod. And he was concerned about what he learns about Jesus. He's concerned about him. He's worried about him. He thinks that he's John the Baptist raised from the dead. And so to explain that, Mark gives a flashback to the execution, the beheading of John the Baptist. But all that fits in with what follows. So we read beginning in verse 30, the apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. They went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. The people saw them going, and many recognized them, and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and it is already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and spend two denarii, 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up twelve full baskets of the broken pieces, and also of the fish. There were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. If I were to ask you, what can't God do? You'd answer, I hope, there's nothing that He cannot do. He's the Almighty. In fact, he told Abraham in Genesis 18, is there anything too difficult, or you can also translate anything too wonderful for the Lord to do? And the answer, of course, is no. <clears throat> well, can he create a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it? Skeptics like that question. The answer is no. So there are things God cannot do. He cannot do the absurd. He cannot do what is foolish. He cannot do what is irrational. He cannot make a rock that he cannot lift. He cannot do anything that limits himself. He cannot lie. That's repeated twice in the New Testament. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, and in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18, it is impossible for God to lie. And when we see something like that repeated in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is saying, this is something you need to remember and believe. He is completely 
reliable, and all-powerful. So do we trust him? Theology is not abstract. Theology that is correct is very practical. And when we understand that God is the Almighty, that He's all-powerful, the implication of that, the application of that is then trust Him. Do we? There's a story you've probably heard about Charles Blondin, who was an English acrobat and the first man to cross Niagara Falls on a tightrope. It uh, was a great sensation when it occurred. He uh, walked from the American side to the Canadian side and back. The crowd cheered wildly. So he asked them, do you think that I can carry a man across on my back? Yes, yes, we believe. Okay, he said, who will volunteer to go with me? The crowd was silent. A year or so ago, uh, one of the men told that story in the evening, Sunday evening meeting. And I remember it because, one, he told the story well, and he also added that Blondin did things like um, he cooked an omelet over the falls and ate it. But also, w when the meeting ended and I got in my car to leave, I turned on the radio and someone was telling that same story. Exact same story. So what I heard here 30 minutes earlier, someone in New York was telling and ended with the same punchline, okay, who will volunteer to go with me? Silence. Repetition fixes things in our minds. And so it is with our passage, Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44, the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only miracle the Lord did that is repeated in all four Gospels. Now that indicates how important it is and that the Holy Spirit wants us to remember it, to believe it, and, and to learn its lesson, its lessons for that matter, which are, are three, but the principal lesson that the Lord gives here is there's nothing that God cannot do. So trust Him. He doesn't ask us to do zany things like uh, take a tightrope across a dangerous waterfall. But he does say, follow me through a world that is even more dangerous than that. He is reliable. He is trustworthy. He cannot lie. And that's what Jesus was teaching his disciples in that incident and what's recorded here in Mark chapter 6. The lesson occurred after the disciples returned from a preaching mission that Jesus had sent them on through, throughout the villages of Galilee. Uh, he sent them out after his hometown of Nazareth had rejected him. But then, but before reporting their return, Mark includes this flashback on Herod beheading John the Baptist. Together, those two incidents of rejection and violence show the nature of the world into which Jesus was sending his 12 disciples and in which he sends us, his church. It is hostile to those who carry the gospel. That's the mission we are all on. Our field of ministry is filled with dangers and it's filled with disappointments. Mark makes that clear here and does so to show the necessity of looking to and trusting in the Lord. But what Mark and the other evangelists demonstrate from the Lord's miracle of feeding the multitude is that Christ is sufficient for all of our needs wherever we go. The disciples learned that on their mission. He had sent them out without food or money, you'll remember, only with a staff and the clothes on their backs. And they returned to tell of what a success the ministry was and all that they had accomplished. 
the Lord had providentially provided for all of their needs and He'd given them success in preaching and teaching and healing and all that they did. But now after all of that they needed some time off. They needed some time to recuperate. So Jesus tells them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For, Mark says, there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. They went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. Now Luke identifies the place to which they went, a place near Bethsaida, which is on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the Lord chose that place because it provided them with privacy. The vacation, however, was short-lived. Really, it ended before it began because the people saw where they were going and they ran around the, the, the shore of the sea and they arrived at the place before the disciples did. And Mark wrote in verse 34 that when Jesus went ashore and saw the large crowd, He felt compassion for them. Now that too is a lesson from this passage. Christ cares. He cares about people and especially He cares about those who are suffering and in need. That's the kind of King He is. And His compassion, His character revealed here is revealed all the more clearly in contrast to King Herod's cruelty in the previous passage. Herod takes life. Jesus sustains life. Herod gives a feast for himself and his rich influential friends. Jesus feeds a multitude of poor hungry strangers. Herod's feast was immoral. It was prideful. It was selfish. Christ's feast was pure and selfless. In fact, he interrupted a vacation to feed and provide for people. The, the contrast between the two is very clear. The contrast is stark. Herod cared for no one but himself. Jesus cares for other people. And he cares for you. When he sees you in Whatever your situation is, your distress or your disappointment, He sees, He feels compassion for you. It is deep, it is pure. Don't think that because you can't feel His eyes on you that He isn't looking and seeing and that He isn't feeling. He is. He is, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, the God of all comfort. Now you might say, well, that's speaking there in 2 Corinthians of God the Father. But God the Father and God the Son are one. And God the Father sees through Christ and through the Spirit, the three persons in the one Godhead. I and the Father are one. If you were in Mike Black's class a few weeks back when he was teaching on the Proverbs, he spent some time on that verse to point out that 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 verse, that statement, I and the Father are one, the one in Greek is neuter, which means one thing. We're one unit. We are one Godhead. And so what is true of the Father is true of the Son. And we can say of the Son, He is the God of all comfort. And He extends that to us. And He will not fail you because He is well able to meet all of our needs in His time and in His way as is demonstrated here in this passage. But he not only has the power to do that, he has the wisdom to do it in the best way. He knows our needs better than we do. He felt compassion for the crowd because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He saw immediately that their greatest need was their spiritual need. They had no teacher of God's Word. Well, they had rabbis, Pharisees and scribes who cared about the letter of the law and enforcing obedience to it, but who cared little for the people's souls. These were God's chosen people that He looked out upon and that were neglected. Prophet Hosea 
had seen the same problem. He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And it grieved the prophet. And it grieved the Lord deeply. He felt compassion for them. Then he acted. He did what was necessary. He became a shepherd to the shepherdless. Mark says he began to teach them many things. What followed later that day was, was more dramatic. The feeding of the multitude, it was uh, miraculous. But what he did here, what he did at the beginning was more necessary. He taught them. He taught them a lot, many things, Mark says. And the lessons went so long that the disciples felt, felt the need to stop him. They came and said to him, the place is desolate and it's already quite late. So they thought the, the Lord ought to stop teaching. He's going too long and he was forgetting the, the time and, and he needed to send the people away to the surrounding villages so that they could find something to eat while it was still light. That seems like a sensible thing. The reality is whenever we question God, we're wrong, and they were, but the Lord recognized that. He had a different idea from the disciples. He said, let's send them away so they can find something to eat. And Jesus answered, no, no, we can do better than that. You give them something to eat. John says that he, he did this only to test them, but they, they didn't know that. And so, amazed at what he said to them, all in disbelief, they said, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? Now, 200 denarii is roughly the equivalent of a, a year's wage for a laborer. So, what would that be in in our currency, maybe $50,000, something like that. They didn't have that kind of money, and they weren't serious about what they were saying. They weren't serious about the possibility of going out and buying food and bringing it back. What they were saying was, what you're asking is impossible. I mean, just, just the logistics of catering such a meal was not only impossible, it's impractical. We can't do that. But Jesus wasn't finished. Since they didn't have the money, he asked, what do you have? How many loaves do you have? Go look. And so they went and they looked and they said, well, we, we've got five loaves and two fish. It, it, it was less than a box of crackers and a can of sardines. It wouldn't have fed the 12, much less the crowd. It just wasn't possible, which is the lesson that the Lord was teaching them. Now, the great preacher Alexander McLaren wrote that the best preparation of God's servants for their work in the world is the discovery that their stores are small. We need to know the source of our strength. It's not in us. Our strength is in the Lord and in Him alone. Our stores are small. Our stores are empty, to be very accurate. We are dependent upon Him. And that's the first lesson that, that He was teaching them here with this test that He gave them. They are not by themselves sufficient for the tasks that He will give them. He had taught them that in their preaching mission when he sent them out without provisions. He sent them out in a way that they would have to depend completely upon him and they learned his faithfulness through that. He was teaching it again here because they needed to learn what Paul would later say to the Philippians in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now that's great confidence. Why does Paul have that confidence? I can do all things because of what follows through him who strengthens me. We all need to learn that. Then we can walk with wisdom and with humility and with confidence, with strong faith. But first we must learn that our stores are small. Often 
it's failure that teaches us that lesson. We don't want to fail. We try to avoid failure. We should try to avoid failure. A failure is always painful. But sometimes it's through our failures that we learn. Abraham experienced a huge failure in Genesis chapter 12. It's really the beginning of the story of Abraham and he goes down to Egypt where he wasn't supposed to go. He doesn't look to the Lord. Famine comes on the land and he goes down there and you know the story of how he really betrayed his wife and the result of that was a chastening that he was given by Pharaoh of all people, by the, a pagan. So he returned back to Canaan and there we read in chapter 13 that he returned to the altar and following that in chapter 14 he has one of the great victories in his life when he defeats the four kings of the east. So failure led to the altar which led to great victory. The disciples failure was not looking to Christ. That's brought out to them through all of this. They didn't say Lord we can't do that but you can. Either it didn't occur to them, which is odd perhaps because they've already gone through a storm on the sea and seen the Lord calm it and said, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? But they don't make the connection and they don't see that here. They seem to doubt that he could do it himself because after all they're in a desolate place. Well that was Israel's failure when God brought them out of Egypt and into the wilderness, into a desolate place. Asaph recorded their doubts in Psalm 78 and verse 19. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Can God feed us out here in the Sinai? Well, yes, He can, and He did, and He did it every day. He prepared a table in the wilderness for them. And here the Lord would show the disciples that He can prepare a table in the wilderness as well. Verse 39, He commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. This is the good shepherd shepherding the sheep just as he is described in Psalm 23, making his sheep to lie down in green pastures where he prepares a table. These shepherdless, shepherdless sheep lie down on green grass where Jesus begins to feed them. And he took five loaves and two fish and looking up toward heaven he blessed the food and broke the loaves and he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them and they divided up the two fish among them all. The result was, Mark writes in verse 42, they all ate and were satisfied. In fact, the people had all they wanted. There were even leftovers. The disciples picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. E each disciple had a uh, a basket for himself, whereas before they only had one small basket between them. It was an amazing day. And most people in the ancient world were concerned about having enough to eat each day. And here they are given a banquet in the wilderness of all places and they were taught many things. What a day that was. They were fed spiritually and physically. Mark caps off the story by giving the number of people fed and satisfied, 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Matthew adds that that didn't count the, the women and children, which makes this all the more amazing because that would mean there was at least 15,000 people, we would think, maybe even 20,000 people, and they all ate and they were all satisfied. They couldn't eat any more. Well, how did he do that? It's not explained how this took place. You've probably wondered, how did this happen? Uh, McLaren again wrote, the pieces grew under his touch 
And the disciples always found his hand full when they came back with their own empty. Christ filled their empty hands as they fed the people. That gives us a third lesson. The disciples served. It was Christ's work, but he used them in it. He cares for the needy. That's the first lesson. He helps and is able to provide is the second lesson. That's the main lesson of this passage. But the third lesson is here. God works through people. He uses the useless. He makes them useful and effective. When the disciples gave the little bit that they had to Christ, he was able to take that and do much with it. The little bit that they gave to him, he fed a multitude with that. And that's what we do. That's what disciples do. They, they serve people by giving out what Christ supplies. Now that may be literally giving out food <clears throat> or some financial help, some physical help. In fact, that's what we're doing here in this crisis that uh, has hit the state of Texas. And so we're collecting food and money and sending that. And we hope you contribute. It's a Christian thing to do. We, we, we serve the Lord in all kinds of ways and in, in, in whatever way presents itself to us at the, the moment. We're to be prepared to do that. But the lesson is God will use His people to do that, to do His work in this world. And we can do great things for Him as we look to Him and as we depend upon Him. And we see Him provide everything that we need. He dispenses to us what we dispense to others. Now that's what we're to see here. He provides. Most importantly, what He provides is not material good, but spiritual blessings. It, it, it is basically the truth of the Gospel. It's the message that Christ is the Savior of all who trust in Him. He's what's pictured here in this miracle. The bread of life. This is what uh, John develops in his account of this event in John chapter 6. And the next day he speaks to the people and explains the miracle that they'd seen. And he calls himself the bread of life. And he speaks of himself as the bread that came down from heaven. He's miraculous. He saves us. He sustains us. We live from him with the life that is eternal. He is the greatest, most satisfying blessing that there is. And He uses us to tell others the good news. He uses us to bring them to Himself and make them into a new creation. And we're not adequate for that. If you begin to think about the mission that He's given us, Who's adequate for that? And yet He uses us to do that. He takes the little that we have, He takes our faith, He takes our knowledge, our energy, our skill, and He makes it all profitable. In fact, the, the knowledge that we have, the faith that we have, the, the very energy that we have is a gift from Him as well. So what we have to offer Him is really what He gives us in the first place. But what it tells us is we're not adequate for that in and of ourselves. But He is. And He uses us and what we have to do His work. He takes the little that we have to do that. And I think we see that here. Someone pointed out, I think it was James Boyce, that Jesus could have fed the multitude differently. He could have simply made a loaf and a fish appear in the pocket of each man and woman that was there. Could have done that. Very simple. Would have been miraculous. Would have been surprising. And all looked around. We, I've got one in my pocket too. Where'd that come from? Instead, he took the small and, and inadequate resources the disciples had and gave them back to them in such a way that they were able to feed a multitude with food to spare. And he does the same with each of us. He, 
He uses us and our gifts as we yield them to Him. Maybe it's just a kind word said at the right time, taking the opportunity to, to do good for others. It's, in the providence of God, all kinds of things are presented to us. Perhaps we need to pray that the Lord will open our eyes to, to the opportunities that He gives. And we take those opportunities and He blesses them. Our resources are small. They are inadequate, but His are not. He can do a lot with a little. In fact, He can do a lot with absolutely nothing. He is sufficient for everything. And again, the reason for that is He is God. That's what this incident demonstrated. The one who fed the 5,000 plus in the desolate place is the same one who fed the Hebrews out of Egypt when he led them out of that land of slavery and fed them in the wilderness. So nothing is too difficult for him. Nothing is too wonderful for him. He will always provide for us even in the most difficult of times and places. He is always with us. He is the good shepherd. He never leaves the sheep. And as we walk with Him and look to Him by faith, He gives us what we need to succeed in our life and in our witness. He will do that because He cares, He is compassionate, and He's faithful. We need to remember that. Because the world into which the Lord has sent us challenges our faith in many, many ways. It challenges us in regard to our witness. It's a, a big world. It is an Im, implacable world in its unbelief. Who are we to feed the bread of heaven, the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, to people who are by nature indifferent, by nature even hostile, and in many, many cases far smarter than we are? Who's sufficient for that? But remember, what we give to others is not from us. It's from the Lord. That's where the sufficiency is. It's not what comes from our hands, but the Lord's hands. His word is sufficient. It is powerful. But there, were, there are other things as well that challenge us. Many things in this life put us to the test. Now, for example, when you're young, you need to get into school. You worry about that. Can I get into the school that I want to go to? And then we get out of school, we have the concerns, well, can I get a job? And when we get a job, can I keep my job? And the, the list goes on of the things that test our faith. And, the, 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 the real test in all of that is, can we trust the Lord for all of that? And how we respond to those situations is also a, a witness to our faith. And still, we wonder, can the Lord provide for us? That's what we're always facing in this life. Is He sufficient for the situation I'm in? Is He sufficient for our needs? Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Now, we all believe that He can. Christians believe that. We, we read about it in the book of Exodus. We don't doubt that. We read about it in the four, all four Gospels. We don't doubt that. But do we trust Him to do it in our lives daily? A lot of us probably are more like that crowd at Niagara Falls than we would like to admit. They believed the acrobat could carry them over and back. They didn't want to put him to the test. In that case, I understand completely. But in the case of, of the Lord and His sufficiency, there's no explanation for a child of God's failure to walk by faith other than weak faith. We all suffer from that. That's why the Lord gave instruction in Matthew chapter 6 on worrying about the basics of life, food and clothing. He said, don't worry. 
Don't worry. If your heavenly Father feeds the birds, if he feeds a sparrow, is he going to feed you? Will he not take care of you? Are you not much more important to him than those? That's true. And that comforts us, but we still worry. So often we are like Jacob. Jacob was a genuine man of faith. He valued the things of God. His brother Esau didn't. He valued them. But he lived much of his life by scheming and doing the things that the, the way the world does things. And it always got him in trouble. When he was an old man, looking back on his life, he confessed, few and unpleasant have been the years of my life. But at the very end, when he was blessing his grandsons, he spoke of the Lord as the God who fed me all my life long unto this day. Even in his weakest moments, God was with him, feeding him. Literally, his statement is, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. And he's the same for us. The God of Jacob is the God of the Christian. He's God, and he is our shepherd. And, and just as a shepherd takes care of his flock, he protects it and provides for it. He leads it into green pastures. He feeds the sheep. So too, the Lord feeds us. We need to understand that and believe it and trust Him daily. Not only for food and finances, but for everything. Life is, is sprinkled with disappointments, and some of them are really bitter disappointments. We all have hopes and aspirations in life, uh, and good ones, good aspirations, good desires, good hopes, but they don't always happen, at least not, not as we expect them to happen, not as we plan for them or hope for them to happen. But we should never think that the Lord has neglected us, that, that He doesn't have a plan for us, and, and, and even a purpose for those trials and those disappointments. Jacob learned from his disappointments. But again, one of, of the lessons of this miracle is that the Lord cares, never neglects his sheep. If he looked at the crowd and felt compassion for them, then we can be assured that he's always looking on us with that same compassion. The words of the psalmist are true. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Because the Lord has compassion personally, individually on you, on his people. And remember again, one thing that the Lord cannot do is lie. He keeps his word always. His promises are yes and amen. And we as his people are to say amen to all of those promises. George Mueller gave an amen to all of that. He's one of the great modern examples of a life of, of faith uh, and of, of, of an individual who looked to the Lord and experienced his faithfulness all through his long life and his long ministry with the orphans that he cared for. Looking back over his ministry, he said, not once or five times, or five hundred times, but thousands of times have we had in hand not enough for, more, for one more meal, either in food or funds. Thousands of times we didn't have enough food to feed the orphans that day. But he said, not once has God failed us. Not once have we or the orphans gone hungry or lacked any good thing. That's because of the God who fed him all of his days. Mueller considered his ministry to be not only for orphans, but also and mainly for Christians in order to show them that God is faithful. That's really why he and his wife set out to have a ministry to orphans. They thought, what ministry can we have that will demonstrate to Christians God's faithful? So they began helping orphans. 
to help orphans, no doubt, but more than that, to show Christians around them that God is faithful and He can be relied upon when we look to Him. And He found God to be faithful every time, always. Never solicited money from people. He didn't seek God's provision in, in, in the ways of the world. He simply sought it through prayer. And he wrote that that model, that model of faith, might be instrumental in strengthening the faith of the children of God and being a testimony to the unconverted. And, and doing things God's way so that he gets the glory and he gets all of the glory is the best way to minister and be a real testimony to the unconverted. The world should see consistency and faithfulness in the church. That's what this incident in Mark 6 was intended to encourage. Trust in the Lord so that when the disciples went out into the world, into a hostile world to represent Him and face all of the dangers and the challenges that they would face, that they would do so with faith and courage. Well, so how do we get that faith? Because as I've indicated, uh, I think we all lack that. We, we, we see the point of the lesson for us individually. How do we get that faith? Well, the Lord indicated that from His response to the crowd. When He saw that the people were like sheep without a shepherd, He began to teach them many things. More than loaves and fishes, they needed spiritual food. They needed God's Word. We need loaves and fishes as well. We need to take care of the material needs of, of ourselves and of others and those around us. But fundamentally, the most important thing is spiritual food. That's what we need. That's what nourishes our souls, which nourishes our faith. Paul wrote in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing. Do you want the wisdom that Jacob finally got, and, and do you want it sooner than he got it? Do you want George Mueller's life of faith? Do you want to be a, a bold servant of the Lord? Well, then learn from the Lord. That involves study. That involves prayer. That involves faithfulness. What, what satisfies the soul is the bread that comes from the Lord's hand, His Word. It strengthens us. The Lord told His disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep into the midst of wolves. That's a way of saying I'm sending you out into a hostile world. But the Lord's sufficient for it. He will provide what we need as we look to Him. If you're here without Him, if you have not believed in Jesus Christ, we invite you to come to Him. He's sufficient for your greatest need. And what's your greatest need? It's forgiveness. It's the removal of sin. It's the separation of that as far as the east is from the west, and only He can do that. You're a sinner. We all are. But He died to pay for the sins of all who trust in Him. So do that. Trust in Him. Come to Him. He receives all who do. And He then becomes their great shepherd. will never forsake us. May God help us to do that, to look to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us and what a great miracle it was. Certainly you want us to reflect deeply on this miracle. It's the one that's repeated in all of the Gospels. And so we pray that you would do that and still within our hearts great confidence in yourself, great confidence in your Son, great confidence in our triune God. May we walk by the Spirit and be faithful. Give us what's lacking, and what's lacking in us is understanding and faith. We are weak. Make us strong, Father, in your service. We thank you for all that we have in your Son. He is all sufficient. It's in his name we pray. Amen.